Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. One of the things I love about the resurrection is how much truth it has even for our lives today. Today we're going to be discussing the resurrection as we look at Matthew 28. Thank you for listening. It is so great to have you part of this study. Again, today we're looking at Matthew 28, which contains Jesus' resurrection and his final commission of the disciples as he is calling them to take his message into the world. Now, as we begin our study together today in Matthew 28, let's just start by laying the foundation of what is the resurrection. If you've been a part of these podcasts, then you'll remember that in the Old Testament, we have seen several prophecies about the coming resurrection. Remember Job 19, 25 to 27? It was a while ago. Job is probably one of the oldest books in the Bible. But in Job 19, 25, 28, here's what Job says. Listen to this. It's just incredible. He says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart is faint within me. I mean, he is just blown away by this. This is great stuff here. You've got one of the oldest books of the Bible letting us know that one day there will be a resurrection and we will see God in the flesh. Now, along those same lines, about a month or so ago, we were in Daniel chapter 12 and in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, here's what Daniel says. He says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And that just shows us that both the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected, the righteous to glory with the Lord, the unrighteous to contempt or judgment in hell. And so the Bible has been letting us know for a long time that there is a future resurrection that's coming. Now, when we say resurrection, what are we talking about here? We need to understand that the term resurrection means a whole lot more than simply coming back to life. Now, there are a number of places in the Bible where people come back to life, but they're not resurrected. For example, you got passages like 1 Kings 17, where Elijah raises the widow's son. 2 Kings 4, Elisha does the same thing for a boy. Or in John 11, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. These people all came back to life, but they did not receive an immortal life that comes with the resurrection. They died at some point afterwards. So really, they came to life, but they were not resurrected. You see, when the Bible talks about a resurrection, it's talking about something different. The resurrection is when someone steps into the immortal life they will now have for all time. You see, the Greek word for resurrection is anastasis, and it literally means to stand up. Kind of almost like getting up out of bed, but really standing up into the new life that you'll have forever. Daniel 12 makes it clear that everyone will undergo this anastasis. God's people will stand up and enter into God's blessings of glory, and God's enemies will stand up and enter God's judgment for their sins. And so now that's just a quick overview of the term resurrection. Now let's go to Matthew 28 and talk about Jesus' resurrection. As we turn to Matthew 28, if you read this chapter already, you know that Matthew 28 opens on Sunday morning following Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus had been crucified on the cross on Friday three days earlier. That was Good Friday. Because of the Sabbath, the disciples had not ventured very far from their homes, and so they haven't gone to his grave yet. Now, in Matthew 28, it's early Sunday morning, and you've got these two women, both named Mary, going to his grave to grieve. But at this point, Jesus has already been risen from the grave. They don't know it, but that's already happened. And so while they're on their way to the tomb, an earthquake occurs, and an angel appears and and rolls away the stone that was covering Jesus' grave. And that's just a key point there, because back then, these stones were huge. Uh, They were intentionally difficult to move. They didn't want people robbing graves, so they would put these heavy stones against the grave so no one could get in. And then we saw back in Matthew 27 that the Romans had specifically sealed this grave with the Roman seal and placed guards in front of it to be sure that nobody would tamper with it. And yet the stone has rolled away. This thing is weighing a thousand pounds or more. And going back to Matthew 28, it says it was moved by an angel. And so this angel appears, rolls away the stone. The guards see this and they just faint. And they're just, they're just knocked out by this. They're, they just can't believe it. And so at this point, the women arrive. Everything is just out of whack. The angel said to them, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who's been crucified. He's not here, for he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly, tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. So you got all this going on here. The women see this and and they get the message and they take his advice and they run back to the disciples and they tell the disciples that Jesus was risen from the dead. 
except that on their way, in verses 9 and 10, Jesus meets them and greets them. Now, they're stunned by seeing the resurrected Lord. They, they fall down and they worship him. And they have this beautiful reunion. But it is short-lived, and he tells them to go to the disciples and gather them together to meet with him. Now, the other gospel accounts tell us that they go back to the disciples with this incredible news. Peter and John run back to the tomb, and they find things just like the woman described, just this amazing events going on all around them. Now, notice in Matthew's gospel in verse 11, the guards go back to town, they tell what's happened, and their leadership bribe them and say, let's just tell a story where the disciples stole his body while you're all asleep. Now, we know that's not true. I mean, there's no way that could be true because these are Roman soldiers guarding a tomb that had been sealed with a Roman seal, and they were placed there specifically so that nobody would mess with the tomb. And so if this had actually happened, these soldiers would have been executed for dereliction of duty. Instead, they were bribed to lie, which is just a tacit admission of the truth that Jesus was raised just as Matthew records here. Well, later in the day, in Luke 24, verse 13, Jesus then appears to two disciples who are walking on the road to Emmaus. After that, those disciples go running back to Jerusalem, and they tell the 11 disciples what had happened. And while they were all there just trying to figure out what's going on, Jesus stands in their midst and says, peace be with you. Now, each gospel records how these events unfold differently, but in a nutshell, Jesus then spends 40 days with the disciples teaching them about his kingdom, and then we come to the end of Matthew 28. And in Matthew 28, their education is now complete, and he sends them into the world announcing the gospel of his kingdom. And so, that's Matthew 28, and that's Jesus' resurrection in a nutshell. But we still haven't really gotten to just the beauty of the doctrine of the resurrection and what the resurrection truly means. So let's pause for a moment and just talk about what does the resurrection show us about God and about our sin and about the future hope we have in Christ. So, what's the resurrection mean? Well, for one thing, it shows us the length that our Father, our God, has gone through to be in fellowship with you and I. You see, God could have left us in the grave. He doesn't, though. He wants to have fellowship with us. He wants to show us his love. He wants us to enjoy the new creation he has created for us that we'll enjoy forever. And so the resurrection shows how much he loves us. It also shows us the future hope we have in Christ. Right now, we live in a world that's drowning in sin and judgment. We see this played out in the news every night. We don't have any idea what it's like to live in a realm that's without sin, without God's judgment. But the resurrection, it gives us a glimmer of a world that has been unspoiled and perfect according to God's design. And at some level, the resurrected life we see in Jesus is the future life we will have one day as well. Now, that's all some great stuff, but there's still one more important truth about Christ's resurrection, and that's in relationship to our sin. You see, the resurrection proves that God has accepted Jesus' payment on our behalf and that all of our sins are gone from God's record books for all time. You see, when Jesus was on the cross, God placed our sins upon him. You see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, He made him, that would be God made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. And so the sins of all of God's people were placed on Jesus. And like a parent who pays for the kid's college credit card, Jesus paid the debt that we owe to God. And the resurrection relates to all of this because the Bible says that death is the wages for our sins. When we sin, we experience God's judgment. When we experience God's judgment, that is a wage that must be paid, and it is paid for by death. This is what God warned Adam and Eve all the way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. God said that in the day they sinned, they would surely die. And in Genesis 3, when they did sin, they did die spiritually. They later died physically. And all of that's just unpacked in Romans 6, 23, when it says the wages of sin is death. And so the wages of sin is death. And even if we sin just one time, just once in our entire life, we still must die. And that's why Jesus died. Now, be, let's be careful. He didn't die because of any sin of his own. He never sinned. He never did anything to earn the wage of death. But the reason why he died was because our sins, my sins and your sins were placed on Jesus. And therefore, he suffered the penalty of our sins on our behalf. Now, let's just kind of just step back for a moment, just one more time. The wage of just one sin is the grave. But the fact that Jesus rose from the grave means he fully paid for every single sin that was placed on him. You see, if there was any unpaid sin that was still left on Jesus, if he was still kind of like paying off a little bit more here, 
then he would still be under the judgment of death and he would still be in the grave. But the fact that Jesus rose from the grave means that every single sin that was placed on him, he fully paid for. There is no longer any reason to hold him in the grave because every debt was fully satisfied. Therefore, God fully accepted his payment and therefore he then rose from the grave. Every sin was paid for. There was now no more reason for him to be in the grave. This is great stuff. And Romans 4.25 just unpacks this idea saying, He who was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because of our justification. What's justification mean? We'd like to say it's just as if I'd never sinned. And he was raised because we are now justified. We are now free and forgiven in Christ. Acts 2.24 likewise says, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in this power. Why was it impossible? Because there was no longer any penalty placed on him. Why? Because he had fully paid for every sin that was on him. And that shows us God accepted his payment for our sins. The debt of our sin is gone. The record is removed. They are forgiven. They are washed away. And anyone who had their sins placed on Christ is now pure in the eyes of God. Not only that, but now that Jesus has risen from the grave, he intercedes for us. Romans 8, 33 and 34 says, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And so because Jesus has died for our sins and paid for our sins and risen because that payment's now been complete, he can now be with the Father interceding for us. What does that intercession look like? Well, Scripture doesn't really get into the details of it. But when you look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says that Satan accuses us before God and no doubt Christ's intercession silenced those accusations because Satan can't condemn us for anything that's already been paid for at the cross. It's gone. And so our Savior shows us his love by dying for us, by paying the wage of our sin. And now that he has risen, he is still constantly interceding on our behalf. And so that's the meaning of the resurrection. The resurrection shows us his love, how we were bound in sin. He could have just left us that way, but he wants that fellowship with us. He wants to spend eternity with us. He wants us a part of his kingdom. And so the Father laid the sins of Christ's people upon Christ, and Jesus made the full payment on our behalf. And we know that that payment fully satisfied God's justice because there's no longer any sin to hold Jesus in the grave. And now that he has risen from the grave, he has ascended back to the right hand of the Father, and he makes intercession for us even right now. And so all of that is how the resurrection is still relevant to our lives today. Now, as we continue on in Matthew 28, there's still one more section in this passage that's critical to us as followers of Christ, and that's the Great Commission when Jesus commissions the disciples and, by extension, commissions us to go into the world with his message. If you look at Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it says, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so right there, I just love how there's just a picture of the Trinity here. We're baptizing them in the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. What's baptism is this idea where people are just dying to their old life and entering into a new life of Christ. And this is the message we are to go into this world with. If you look at verse 19, Jesus says, go therefore. He just assumes that we're going to go into this world, whether it's going to our neighbors, going to people at work, going maybe on a short-term mission trip, or maybe going on a full-time mission trip. We are to be continually bringing this message to the world around us. What are we to do? Jesus says in verse 19, we're to make disciples of all the nations, not just Jewish people, all the nations. But what does it mean to make disciples? Well, that word make disciples is actually just one word in the Greek. It's really just a verbal form of disciple. Like we might just say, hey, Bob's discipling Bill or something like that. It's that idea of just this verbal form of teaching, discipleizing. And so Jesus is telling these disciples here to carry on his message and his ministry, going into all the world, announcing that the king has come calling people to be reconciled to the king and then teaching them to observe all that he has commanded. When we teach to observe all that he's commanded, this inherently means we're teaching people what Jesus has taught and then how to obey what he has taught that they might walk in his ways according to his kingdom. 
And so Jesus is the messianic king, but not just for the Jewish people. He is for anyone who will come to him to be a part of his kingdom. His kingdom people follow his commands, and they then carry his commands, take his commands into the world around them, teaching them what God has commanded and how to live out what he has commanded, that we might walk together glorifying him as we wait for his return. And so that's the message we are to carry into the world around us. So that's Matthew 28. And for a final wrap-up here of this passage, as you consider just what this has been teaching us, let's just pause for a moment and reflect upon the resurrection. If you are one of Christ's people, your sins were placed on him, and when he rose from the grave, that's proof to you that your sins are fully gone, the wage is fully paid for, the debt is gone, the record of them is gone, you've been fully forgiven. That was all done by Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection. And so as we close out our time, how about you just pray to Jesus and just thank him for what he did for you on the cross and what his resurrection accomplished. And if you're not one of Christ's people, well, you can be reconciled to him right now. Just call upon him, ask for forgiveness, ask to be a part of his kingdom. He'll put his spirit within you and guide you in these things. And you too can then be celebrating what Christ did on the cross for you and what his resurrection shows to you. Well, now as we go throughout the rest of our day, how about we then just pray for and look for opportunities to teach people what Christ commanded and how to observe his commands, even by our own life and by our own example. Well, so much more could be said, but we'll leave things there. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. And until then, God bless.